Hey, you're listening to the Road to a Billion podcast. I'm your host, Stefan Georgi, and I'm glad to have you with me here today. The Road to a Billion is a call-in radio show where you can ask me questions about freelancing, copywriting, entrepreneurship, mindset, scaling funnels, relationships, money, and more. And there are two reasons for the name, The Road to a Billion. One is because my the things that I've sold are gonna reach a billion dollars in sales. As in I've, I've generated... Well, we'll have generated a billion dollars in sales for myself and my clients by the end of this year. Uh, and the other reason is because I want to help impact the lives of at least a billion people in the next 20 years. And I don't, I, the more I think about that 20 years, the more that annoys me. So I'd really prefer it's like five years. But for now, we'll keep saying 20 years and, and we'll go from there. Uh, but we'll start taking calls in about five minutes from now. Uh, if you, the way that works is if you want to put your question into the Q&A section of Zoom, go ahead and do that. And then Ed Ray will be reviewing the questions, feeding them to me, and we'll answer as many as we can. Ed, do you want to go ahead and give a, a quick hello and introduction? Hey, what's up? My name is Ed Ray. Uh, I actually have my little bio dialed in since last time because it was really good. I got some feedback on that. So I help make people's funnels Facebook friendly so they can get some of those Zuck bucks. That's all I can. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, I think if you use a Zuckbox, as long as you keep using that, it's very memorable. So and compliant, and compliant. That's true. It's much better than make those dollars. Dollar dollar um, bills, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So yeah, go ahead and pop your questions into the uh, the Q and A feature here of Zoom, and we'll start answering them in a second. Before we do though, and by the way, hey to everyone else coming in here. Hey, Gerline, uh Christopher Ogle, what's up, Lorraine? By the way, uh, John Caprani, sorry about. I said that John was in the UK earlier and he's in Ireland and obviously there's a bit of a history between, you know, those two spots. So, um, John, I apologize for that. It's kind of funny. Cause I'm like, well, it's like, it's a really, it's a bad mistake to make. Right. It's like, uh, it's, it's brutal. So I do apologize, John. Um, but yeah. Hey, Pedro, what's up too? Uh, can you tell from the ginger hair? I know I should have been able to. Lakshmi, what's up, man? So, okay, before we get into the Q&As, yeah, the thing I wanted to talk about today is, is, so my daughter watches Sesame Street, loves Sesame Street, and so I watch a lot of Sesame Street, and they have the number of the day, and they have the letter of the day, but for me, we're going to talk about the number of the day, and the number of the day for us on this call today is $6,250. And why is that the number of the day? Because that is what my hourly rate is. Why is that my hourly rate? Because I have the income goal of a million dollars per month this year. And I look at it and say, okay, there's four weeks in the typical month, uh, 40 hours per average work week. That means there's 160 hours that I have per month that I'm working. And if I want to make a million dollars in income, that means I have to generate $6,250 per hour. So that's a really useful thing on its own because simply knowing that, taking whatever your monthly income goal is, dividing it by the number of working hours in the month, and then figuring out your hourly rate is really helpful. Uh, knowing that helps me in a myriad of ways. It gives me a, if somebody wants me to do consulting for them, which I generally am like, I don't want to do too much one-on-one -on -one consulting. I'm doing this call, right? But like, given that if somebody wanted me to, to get on four calls in a month with them and each call was an hour, then I'm like, all right, perfect. Now I know it's $25,000, right? I know because 6,250 times four is $25,000. So I immediately know what to, what to price for an hour of my time for a consulting call. Uh, it's also why these calls are so valuable. We go for an hour and a half. So you're essentially getting, you know, over $9,000 in value of my time for free on these calls, but I'm happy to do it. But same thing with writing a sales letter. So I wrote a sales letter last week, week and a half for a client and uh, crushed it. It, it. You know, I think the letter is awesome. The client loves it. I think it will do really well. I charged him $50,000, 50,000, uh, And it took me like 15 hours. So you hear that and you go, that's sick. You just, you know, made $50,000 in 15 hours. And it's like, yeah, but if I actually divide 50,000 by 15, that works out to $3,333, which means I actually only get about half of the hourly rate I need. 
by writing sales letters and knowing that information is really valuable. Cause then it's like, crap, I, I'm still going to write some sales copy, but I either need to charge more or they need to be sales letters from my own businesses. Or, you know, maybe you can make an argument that by continuing to write sales letters that go live into the marketplace and do well, that helps keep me visible. People want to keep following me. And then that enables me to charge more in other places. So maybe it's a, a loss leader, but I'm thinking about it in a really specific way because I know what my hourly rate is. Another example of this would be RMBC Applied, which is the new training program I just launched to my list uh, yesterday, where we're going to go through and once a month, I will break down one of my best sales letters I've ever written in excruciating detail from the very beginning to the very end. And I'll talk about the decisions I made, what I think could have been better. I'll show how I use the RMBC method when writing it, whenever that's applicable. And it's a lot of letters that I've never shared with the public before. And I don't really want to share with the public because maybe they're older and they're more aggressive or maybe because uh, they're active right now for a client and the client doesn't want me plastering it all over the internet. So it's a really uh, exciting program. It's gonna be awesome. But even doing that, I'm like, okay, let's say the average call once a month goes for two hours and I'm, gonna char I'm charging $97 a month for this program, which is you know, really kind of low. I, I think it'd be way more. But even then I'm like, all right, cool. So that means I need, I had the math, 129 people. If I get 129 people to join RMBC Applied and it, you know, the breakdown each month goes for two hours, then that equals out to $12,513, which is just you know, $13 over my hourly rate for two hours. So suddenly I have an easy goal, right? So just knowing my hourly rate by taking what my income goal is and dividing it by the amount of hours I'm going to work in a given month helps me to make all kinds of decisions. It helps me to set goals and all of these things. So I would do the same. I, would, I recommend other people do the same thing. Uh, I, with freelancers all the time, I talk with freelancers and they say, I don't know what to charge. And this is how you figure it out. You can take, okay, say someone wants to pay you for a sales letter. Like, all right, well, what is your income goal? Well, I'd like to make $20,000 in a month. Okay, awesome. So given that, 20,000 divided by 160, I don't have my calculator in front of me. If anyone's good with math, they can do it. Or I can pull up my phone and kind of do it DL here. If anyone beats me to it, feel free to. Okay, $125, $125 an hour, perfect. Okay, cool. So I'm like, all right, so your rate is $125 an hour. Now, how many hours is it gonna take you to write this sales letter? And they say, well, it's gonna take me 40 hours. Okay, cool. So 125 times 40, 5,000. So you charge $5,000 for your sales letter done. So it makes it a lot easier to figure out how to quote things, etc. And then if you want to level up, you figure out, okay, you just, what do you want your income goal to level up to? And then you increase your hourly rate effectively and you apply it to everything else you do. Uh, so I just think that's a really important way to, uh, handle all that kind of stuff. And, um, yeah, I want to share it with you guys. Is that, does that make sense? And is that helpful how that's a good way to, to think about things? Let me know if it is in the chat. And then from there, we'll go into doing Q and A stuff. Sweet. We had two, two people said it was helpful. So good for everyone else. All right. Good. A little, a little more love. Um, there we go. Chat's blown up. <laughs> good. That's what I want to see. Yeah. Ian Pettit said, assuming you have the skills to pay the bills. Yeah, of course you'd need to get good at your, that's always like the number one thing I say. Uh, and, and Justin Goff, my partner in copy accelerator says the same thing. It's like, you know, you have to be good at what you do or you have to get good at what you do. Um, that's really important. Like you do have to, to achieve mastery. Um, and, and, and you don't have to be a master before you can charge $125 an hour, but like, you know, you, you can't completely suck and then be like, I want it. I want to make $10,000 a month or $20,000 a month. But if you just don't have the skills, then you can't do that. But you know, as you're developing and building up your skills, uh, then you can. And, and again, you say your goal is $5,000 a month. Great. What's 5,000 divided by 160. Anyone I'm going to do it for my math, my, my calculator again, $31 an hour. Perfect. Okay, cool. So then say it takes you 40 hours for a sales letter. Um, what's that going to be? That's going to be 
$1,250, so $1,250 for a sales letter. And that's fine. Maybe that's where you're at in your career. But as you get better, you can keep raising your rates. So super important. Um, Dan Sherlock did ask, and I know we're, we're going to do the QAs and, and Ed's going to feed them to me. I'll answer one question in the chat that Dan said, how do you know when you're a good enough level to charge 3K or 5K or 25K for a sales letter? Um, when you're getting results for clients, yeah, that's what, as Alex disagreed with, it's really when you're getting results for clients, when nobody's, uh, you know, um, when pe especially, and then people aren't pushing back on your, on your fees or your rates, um, things like that. I do need to make Ed a, a co-host here so he can work his magic. There we go, Ed. You are now a co-host. Thank you. Feels good. Yeah. Perfect. All right, cool. So yeah, I wanted to share that. And from there, uh, let's jump on in. Beautiful. All right. Well, the first question we have is from Shuya Raghav asking, what are the three biggest lessons you learned about consumer psychology, which really helped you drastically improve your copywriting and marketing skills? Nice. Good question. Shira, the 15 year old Indian sensation. What's up, buddy? Hey, hey, am I audible to you? Yeah, yeah I can hear you. And is the static still there? Uh, it's, it's better than last time. Uh, oh, thank God. Okay. So it's really awesome to be here and I'm really grateful for being here to like interact with you guys and like you are the best copywriters and the marketers in the game. And yeah, that's basically my question that what are the three biggest lessons that you learned about the consumer psychology? Maybe it was from reading books or maybe it was from your own experience. So yeah, three golden nuggets that you want to share with us today. and anything will be fantastic awesome that you share yeah cool man that's a great a great question it's um it's one i have to to think about but i i did as you're as you're asking it um and i don't you know this is this isn't necessarily the top three but it's the three that came to my mind the quickest <laughs> um you know one would be and i've talked about this before that people make decisions based on emotion and not based on logic. I think that's probably the most important one. Uh, people, people buy off their heart, not off their brain. Their brain kicks in to try to stop their heart, but their heart is, comes first. And if you capture somebody's heart, then their mind will, will, will do a double thing where it does try to kind of challenge them, but it also tries to rationalize for them to kind of please the heart. The brain wants to please the heart. So I think that's really, really important. Um, that'd be number one. I think number two is that everybody wants to look smart. Everybody wants to be like a hero. Everybody wants to look like they made a good decision. Uh, so making people feel like they're the smartest person in the room by making a buying decision is really important. Uh, and the more you can make that an exclusivity thing and you can contrast that with a, you know, you versus them aspect. I think that can be important. One of the reasons that conspiracy theories work so well isn't just because they are interesting stories, which is a huge part of it, but it's also because people who buy into it, you're promising now you know the truth, right? 99% of the people out there are, are the sheeple who have their eyes closed and your eyes are open. You know, you're one of the few who, who really gets it. It's the same reason that cults work, right? In a cult, it's like everyone out there, they're the brainwashed ones. Society's brainwashed. We're the ones who have really seen the truth. So there's a sort of select few that you're a part of mentality that is really powerful and really uh, galvanizes people. And then the third one would be that people, and this is sort of related, but people do buy and make decisions based on status. People want to feel like they are ahead of other people. People want to feel like they've made it, like they're accomplished. Like you buy a Mercedes or a Porsche or whatever it is because of status, because you feel like, you know, that says something about you and it differentiates you from others. And it makes you, I mean, it's, it's kind of effed up and it, you know, maybe you can say it shouldn't be this way, but people buy stuff to feel better than everybody else. <laughs> they, you know, it makes them feel like they're better than people. Um, and the same thing though about, you know, whether it's, it's, it's being in a club or join, I mean, Copy Accelerator, the mastermind I run is, is, is hands down the best copywriting mastermind on the planet and probably the best mastermind on the planet, in my opinion. But 
you know, people and people join for, for tangible help and the benefits improvements, but it's also a status symbol as a writer, uh, people who, if you're in copy accelerator and you talk to a bunch of other people who aren't, you sort of are immediately held up and vaunted as being higher up. And that's a status thing. So emotion instead of logic, uh, being like a hero or I mean a hero, but being, um, one of the select few and then envy and status being important. Those are the the top three that came to my mind. Okay, yeah, found, found them really valuable. And I hope this question was a worthy one to be on your podcast because like I brainstormed for 15 minutes to find a good question for your podcast. I thought it was a great question. Okay. I, I appreciate that, man. I love that, you know, you came back after last week and um, yeah, it's awesome to have you here on the call again. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Awesome, thank you, man. It was a really good question. <clears throat> yeah, it really was. It was surprising. I was like, oh, should I have to really think about this one? But that's yeah. good. That's good stuff. Uh, cool. Next question here from Daniel Sherlock. Daniel's asking, do you have any book recommendations for learning about psychology, storytelling, and mindset? What's up, Dan? Hey, can you hear me okay? I can. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks. How are you? Doing well. Thank you. Good, good. Um, yeah, so the question's right there. I mean, I've, mm-hmm. um, I'm towards the end of The Big Leap, which you, I think you recommended in the first yeah. uh, podcast, um, which has been really good. Um, but, you know, obviously with sales copy, we're trying to convince people. So, you know, I've read things like Influence and Persuasion before. Uh, so I just wondered if you had any other psychology books uh, that you would recommend. Um, and then storytelling is obviously a huge part as well. Um, so the same for that. 100%. Um, on the psychology side, I would say there's a good book called You. I think it's, it's you, You're Not So Smart or You Are Not So Smart. And it's a book with um, all of these like logical fallacies and things that, that we make. So, so essentially like um, the straw man fa- fallacy or confirmation bias are all these sort of flaws in human reasoning that we don't see, but that are there. Yeah. Uh, I read that book yeah, a while ago, uh, but it really stuck with me. There was a lot of really interesting stuff in it. So I would really recommend that one. I actually just, I haven't thought about it in a while and just telling you about it makes me want to reread it. I'm trying <laughs> to think of some, some examples. Um, it's just sort of stuff like who survives in a plane crash. Uh, but it's also stuff like who, you know, how you get tricked into to buying stuff. And it's, it's a really, really good book. Uh, another book that's really good. I haven't read in a while, but I should revisit is uh, called Made to Stick. I'm not sure if you've heard of that or read that, but Made to Stick is a really good uh, book. It kind of talks about how to make a point, how, how some points and ideas stick and others don't. Uh, they use an example of when people were trying to, to eliminate saturated fats from uh, popcorn and movie theaters and the scientists essentially were talking about it nobody was listening and then they had like a demonstrable proof where they had a giant like thing of like oil that they held at a press conference and people looked at the oil and they're like this is all in one single thing of your popcorn and then all of a sudden everybody was like oh shit we should probably stop using this oil in our popcorn um but that you know so that's a really good book as well uh Girly, girly nasty, you are not so smart by David McRaney. I'm pretty sure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna secretly Google it while I talk here. You are not. So <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. What was the second one? The airplane one. Made made to stick. Oh, oh so- well, the air the airplane one was also part of you are not so smart by oh, David okay. McRaney. Uh, but made to stick um, is a, is by yeah ideas why some ideas survive and others die. Uh, it's a really good book too. Um, awesome. And then, yeah, as far as storytelling goes, I really go back to just great stories are great stories no matter what or where they come from. So I don't know about books about how to craft like a story, but I would just actually read the great stories that are out there, whether that's, you know, things like The Odyssey by Homer, which is frankly kind of a monotonous read. So maybe just read the (laughs) cliff notes of it. Uh, But studying the hero's journey like what I always say, you yeah. know, the hero's journey is so vital. And if you look at um, like anything that follows that, obviously 
the hero's journey, which was come up, came up with by Joseph Campbell in his book, I think it was like the hero with a thousand masks or something like that. But essentially he was basing that off of the Odyssey and other epics. But I always joke, but I'm not joking actually, uh, that Moana, which I know Ed Ray loves that Moana too. Um, if you look at the, the movie Moana, like the Disney movie, it's yeah. got like, it's one of the most clear cut, clear cut examples of the hero's journey that you'll ever see. Um, and so there's just a bunch of, uh, like good stories that, that follow the hero's journey. I would just watch movies and read books that kind of follow that stuff as well. Sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Beautiful. All right. I was just doing the show notes back here, so I'm back. Let's see. Who do we got? By the way, I love the chat. I love you guys are sharing insights in the chat. I'm seeing, I'm, I'm reading them all that, but, um, and by the way, guys, if you have questions, put them in as, as a Q&A because uh, mm -hmm. that's where Ed will get to them. So if you put them in the Someone chat, then... Someone asking me a question? Wow, oh, look at that, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, you totally can ask a question, Ed, right? That's great. I can take a break, drink a little of my, my cucumber-flavored Perrier and just chill. Nice. It's a good time. Uh, cool. So next up, <clears throat> we have a question from Eric Chan. I know Eric. He says, hello, I landed a client recently, but I always have this thing that happens. So let's say you're on the phone with a client. <clears throat> What's the first information you need to get from the company before writing anything for it? The information the owner gave is a little bit vague and not very specific. Cool. What's up, Eric? How are you? Hello. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. How are you doing? Yeah. Very fine. And you? Good, man. Good. Thanks. Uh, actually, I have uh, two questions. The, the second one just popped up in my head. If you don't mind, I ask the second one too. After the look at you, look at you gain the two for. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, yeah, um, recently I just uh, landed a client, and sometime when I ask them some information about the the company, um, they don't know. For the the answer that they gave me it's like vague, so I don't know. What uh, what information that you have to ask them, you know the, you know before to write anything for for them because sometimes uh, you just need to tweak the the offer and their conversion going to to raise. So I don't need to write any copy, but they can't give me the, those information sometimes. So just want what is your your thought about that? So what? kind of clients are you working are, like are you working in a specific niche or is it all all over the place uh, is uh, e-learning sorry is what is the e-learning industry okay um yeah e-learning got it and um are you writing what kind of copy are you writing for them normally uh actually i'm doing the landing page the facebook ads and the email okay um, and the landing page, what, what, what's the number one reason they, they're hiring you? Uh, actually, I just sent him three free email to let him test. And the thing is, he, don't have a, he, he doesn't have any email sequence, so he wants me to build uh, uh, the email sequence for him and also build uh, the lead magnet for him and actually also the, the landing page at the same time. Okay. So it's, and, it's, it's a whole project. And his main goal is to get more people to buy his program. That's yeah. That's what I tell him because he didn't know what kind of uh, goal he want. So I just uh, like uh, propose him some, some goal that we can, we, we can uh, reach to. Yeah. And what, what is he, is this an existing business or is it a new business? Uh, it's kind of new. I, I think there is already two months ago that he started the, the business. Got it. Yeah, I mean, somebody like this, really, this is where, like, you're probably not getting a lot of information from him because he, to your point, like, he doesn't know, right? And so yeah. this is where you have to be the consultant and come in and tell him what he wants and what he needs, um, which you're kind of doing, it sounds like, right? So you're telling yeah. him, hey, we need to get you more. Co so what, what exactly is the program? Is it like like just a, a course or is it um, like classes or what exactly is it? 
It's just a course. Okay. Yeah. Um, and he's distra- how how much uh is the course? Uh, it's I think it's ninety nine euros. It's a front end offer, and okay. at the back end he have he got I think six hundred euros the the back end. Okay. Got it. Um. Mm. Yeah, I mean, for something like that, really, you know, you have a lot of creative license for somebody like this. I mean, if it were me, I, I would sort of just, uh, I wouldn't rely on the client very much. I, w- I would essentially do what you're doing, which is like, okay, our goal is to get you more front end acquisitions, you know, profitably or at a break even. Um, in order to do that, we need to do X, Y, and Z. And then really all you need to do is go through the course so you know what it is you're actually selling. And that's pretty much it. And okay, which, which is actually nice. I mean, honestly, like, cause one, I'm not saying you make this mistake, but one mistake I see people uh, make is that they do get really dependent on the information that their client gives them. And mm-hmm. even me, when I'm charging 50 grand for a sales letter, I ignore almost everything the client gives me. Uh, literally like all I want to know is like, say it's like a health supplement. Cause I do a lot of that. It's like, what are the ingredients? What are like the, the goals? Like, are you trying to build a brand? Are you trying to have something that's going to just like sort of do a lot of front end acquisitions and you don't care if the company's around in a year or not? Uh, cause that can affect the tone. Right. And what we're saying. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what are like the price points? And that's pretty much it. Like I've had clients who give me just a thousand pages of research. I mean, like all kinds of shit, all kinds of documents, all kinds of other stuff. And like, maybe I look at a few competitors pages and that's it. Cause like, if I, if I, if I take everything that they told me, usually they're hiring you cause whatever they're doing hasn't been working. And they're like, here, here's all the shit that wasn't, hasn't been working. And it's like, I don't, I don't want to look at that, you know? Um, and, and Craig Clemens is, um, the same way. It's funny because I know I when I, I did a project for for Golden Hippo and with uh, Tony Horton, who's the P90X like spokesperson, and um, I remember asking like uh, Craig for for some like other like offers that that were relevant or something, and and even he was like, I don't want to give them to you because I don't want you to look at them. And it was like shit, mm-hmm. man. Like okay, <laughs> but you know, obviously he's done. He's doing like four hundred million a year or whatever they're doing, and you know, and he's a great copywriter and, and the same thing. So mm. I think that's an important lesson is generally. Uh, in a case like that, yeah, you don't, I don't think you need more information than what you have. Okay. So you, you want to ask them the, the result that they're actually getting from the, 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 the previous, uh, like, I mean, like, uh, the copy? No, no, I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd want to know that. I mean, I, again, yeah, I'm thinking okay. if it's really, if it's really new, then obviously you don't have that information, but yeah, if they have like an existing thing and you're sort of beating or optimizing it then yeah i wouldn't want to know the metrics i mean if they don't know okay. the metrics though maybe they're not i mean the guy might not be doing like very many sales or almost any sales you know um mm-hmm. and that could be part of why he doesn't have anything but okay. if he has good metrics then sure i want to know you know hmm. what's the conversion rate what's the average order value if it's a subscription okay. thing what's like the stick rate um you know what's your your cpa right what's the target that you're willing to yeah. Uh, pay to acquire customers, that kind of stuff. But uh, okay. yeah. I take notes. Thanks. Cool. Um, I have the second one, the, the second question, uh, and it's, it's, it's the last one. Um, actually, um, I already come up with kind of three, three strategy for him. Mm-hmm. And the thing is the budget is limited. So he don't want to run the, the three strategy because I just want to test uh, the among the, the three strategy, which one is working the best for him. And he just told me that he, the, the budget is, is limited, so he don't want to test the, the free strategy at the same time. Okay. So what do you do in, in, this, uh, in this situation? Do you follow do... The, your, your golden god and you just put, put one strategy randomly and just test it? Yeah, I mean, I'd look at what, is, what has the highest probability of winning for the client and being a needle mover. Um, you know, so if like all three are great strategies, you know, what's the one that, and not only that, but the client that the client's most likely to implement, and then that's the most likely to 
yield results and that's aligned with what the client's budget is. Because for example, right to your point, it's like, hey, if I can spend a couple hundred dollars a day on Facebook ads, I can do this, this, that. And if the client's like, I don't have a budget for Facebook ads and that just is what it is and no, okay. you're out, right? So you just got to find whatever the one is that is highest, high, highest probability of getting results and that is aligned with what the client is you know, able to do. And then you have okay. to work on getting better clients you know, over time. Yeah. I know that it takes time. Yeah, it takes time, yes. But it doesn't mind. I will <laughs> take the time he, he need. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Th 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 thank you so much for your answer. Yeah. Happy to help. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Next up, we have the legendary Sean Caesar. <laughs> so Sean asks, are headlines with 15 to 25 words, gigantic headlines, the new theme of advertisement? Interesting question. What's up, Sean? Hey, hey, back again. Yeah, good to have, glad to have you back. Thank, thank you, Ed, thank you. Yeah, um, so yeah, you're, you're asking if kind of longer uh, headlines um, or... Yeah, I was, I was doing, you know, um, I was studying some headlines and uh, I found out that the new, you know, the new headlines now are getting so gigantic, 25 words, so big, filling up the whole page and having like too many promises in just one headline. And also they have, you know, they have the sub headline down and the thing up, like the sub headline to up. And I thought like, is this really working bros? I don't know if this ad is working or not. It looks good, but you know, the results are not like are not known for me. So what's your thoughts on the, these gigantic headlines? Yeah, I think, um... They can totally work. It, it depends. There's some factors. If it's like a headline above a, a video sales letter, it's like a video. Yeah, something like this. Yeah, a headline and then a video down and these things. Yeah, I mean, I think that can work. The challenge with that is if the headline is too long and it pushes the video down below the page, <clears throat> like especially on like mobile, right? Where I only have this much of like a screen and like if the headlines, like all of this stuff. So the videos below, I think that can negatively affect conversions. So for a video sales letter, I'd probably try to go for shorter headline. And I generally do, um, for a text sales letter, I don't think there's any harm in having a really like a pre header that's 10 words. And then a big headline that's like 15 words. And then a post headline that's 10 or 15 words, whatever. I think that's fine because then that real estate is great. You know, you're just trying to capture their attention and get them to keep reading. Um, and then besides that, Sean, I mean, I would look at, there are different kind of spy tools you can use, uh, to kind of see like how much traffic, uh, websites are, are getting. So, you know, you may look at a page that has a really long headline in a video, and then you use a uh, similar web or, uh, ad beat or what runs where, or any of those other tools. If anyone has any tools like this, you can pop them in the chat, but basically you could look and see if like that page is getting a million impressions a month and has been getting a million impressions a month for the last like five months or six months. Right. Then it's probably working for them. Uh, you know, having the long headline. So that's how you kind of know if it's working or not. So there's no problem with imitation. Like if I imitate what they have and just emulate it to my copy, I, I just, I just copy what's working. I think that's like, a huge part of my secret to success is like swiping other people and swiping myself. Um, like I have a template that's working right now for sales letters. So now like basically every letter I write is me just swiping the same template again and again and again, because it works again and again and again. So, um, and I think, you know, looking at what works though, and then just, yeah, swiping it or you know, modeling off of it is a very proven strategy. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Next question, we have David Vujic. Objections, is making a big list of objections for copy that we can overcome good? I mean, does conversion, does conversion become better if we answer all possible objections, even those not so common at the cost of making the copy a lot longer and potentially losing people? What's question. up, David? Hi, so uh, I have a question about objection headline. So how are you, Stefan and Ed? I'm, I'm good. That's Ed, awesome. Ed's good That's too. Awesome. He, he yeah. smiled. He's good too. Yeah. 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 
So I wanted to go to the strange, straight to the point. So, mm-hmm. I mean, if if we like, I learned from that from Agora and Jason Capital. So if we do copy boarding and like list all the possible objections and culture, culture, like put them in categories. So do we answer like all possible objections that our avatar, avatar could have, or we just answer like the most most common one? Like, I mean, lo- my logic says if we, like, answer every po- every possible one, like, the copy is going to be a lot longer and we have potential to lose a lot of people there. So what's your mind about that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and by the way, looking at your picture, you do look young, but I think I realize you're, aren't you like 16 too? Yeah, yeah, 16? yeah, yeah I'm 16. I fuck- I love it. I love, I love you, you young guns. Uh, it's so awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think, um, I don't think you should answer every objection. I, I, I think your gut's right. And I think that generally if you are answering the most common ones that you're going to be fine. I, I think there's an opportunity in the FAQs, like as Andrew pointed out in the chat, to answer some more of those objections. And I think you can sort of answer others as sprinkled throughout the copy, but really like people, why don't people buy? Like it's too expensive. Um, it won't work for me. I've been burned in the past. Like slash, I don't believe, you know, you, um, really that's it. Now is now is not the right time, I guess. Right. So there's really like a, like four, four or five objections that are like at most the same, everything else they're saying is really just a manifestation of just a few core objections every time. So I would just focus on what those core objections are that consistently come up. And then as long as you're answering those, like it takes care of most of the other objections too. And and if you try to answer everything to to your point, I think it just makes the copy become boring and it, it draws on for too long or you're raising objections that people didn't even think they had. And suddenly have now planned yeah. new objections in their minds. So I think you're on the right so, track with what you're doing. So uh, do you think about if we could like do a question part about end of the copy, like for people who have like there can see that question, like I have that about that objections, like objection and answer at bottom, full bottom of the copy. Or like you said, it's not good, like I'm, like making them in their head like yes oh that is objection too like you know what i mean yeah i mean i think you can do that on the faq and and you know if you want to go longer and like the close and that's fine one of the uh one of the like the the things that i i talk about that i've seen a lot of other people talk about is once you get to the close and once you reveal your call to action and you're like all right should be $200. $200. It's only $49. Click the button now and like buy. Right. Um, I still have like a formula that I'm following where it's like next is like, by the way, it's guaranteed. Um, right. And, and kind of like covering here's some, there's some bonuses, whatever it is. But after I've, I've done my call to action, uh, at that point, I always say like, go as long as you want. Right. You could have another, if you want at that point, have, you could have another 8,000 words of copy. Like that sounds extreme. I don't think you need to do that. And I've never seen anyone do it. But once I've, once I've gone through everything else and I've gotten my call to action, the whole point is that they should just be buying now. So now I've already, I've, I've played my hand, right? I've showed all my cards. So now there's no, all I want to do at that point is to keep them around until I, I figure out what, why they haven't bought yet and get them to buy. So if I give them all of like the build up, the story, the value, the mechanism, everything there. And then I'm like, all right, you know, all right, buy now, click the button, it's $49 for a limited time. And they still didn't buy at that i'm like oh and it's guaranteed so if it doesn't work no worries now i'm answering an objection you know guarantee yeah. stuff all right buy now they still don't buy it's like okay well it also comes with these bonuses or maybe i do the bonuses first but like you know here's you know you want even more to get the value there it is they still didn't buy like oh did i mention that here's what a bunch of people have said like i just I, you know, at that point you can keep going and, and addressing more objections but yeah. uh really yeah i think i go back to what i said that generally there's only a few reasons people really don't buy and I would just focus on those. And if you want to address some specific stuff, like in the FAQs, then that's the place where you would do that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, what about parts if those, like I'm selling, like if you are selling like a high ticket 
product or information product. Is is it all the same yet? Yeah, I think it's all the same. It's the okay, same thing. I mean, high, high ticket, it's like, I can't afford it. I don't know if it's really going to work for me. Like, am I going return to return on investment? Is this a scam? Are you full of shit? Um, is this really the right thing for me right now? Or should I be doing something else? And it's like, that's really it. No matter what. And that's whether it's a high ticket coaching thing or like a $49 supplement, like it's still the same objections. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So you helped me help us a lot here. Good. I'm happy, happy that I can help. Sweet. All right. Yeah. One thing I quickly want to add on to that, if that's cool, Stefan. Yeah, man. Is you're totally right about it's the same objections, but you with higher ticket stuff, you really have to show the ROI a lot more. Like, for a $49 product, you can get it with, oh, you know, it'll help you do this and that. But most of the time, it's like you literally have to spell out like, okay, if, let's say you're doing biz op, right? It's like, okay, well, this will show you how to make, I don't know, let's say $2,000 this month. Is it worth it to, you know, spend $2,000 now to make $2,000 a month for the next 12 months? Then it becomes a no-brainer. Yeah, I agree with that. And I do one, one piece of advice I've given before that I would come back to is when writing copy, I always recommend adding a zero to the price. So whatever the price is, add a zero and imagine that that's the price. So even if you're selling a $49 product, pretend in your head that it's a $490 product. Because then if I have to sell you a bottle, one bottle of a blood sugar supplement for $490, I'm going to have to go way harder to try and sell you it than for $49. So even if I'm doing a high ticket thing, that's like $2,000, pretend it's $20,000 and be like, shit, like what would I have to really say to this person to get them to be okay with investing $20,000? So one really important way to kind of do that and build the value is just adding a zero to whatever the price is and writing your copy accordingly. I love it. Next up. We have a question from John Kim. And by the way, be sure to put your questions in the Q&A chat and give a thumbs up on the question you want to answer next. So from John Kim, we have, for someone who doesn't have a substantial swipe file, is there an easy way to find winning campaigns, letters, and emails to study? I'm thinking of going to ClickBank's high gravity or popular offers. Is that a good start or is there a better source you recommend? What's up, John? Hey, Stefan. Can you hear how me? How you doing? Yeah, I can. Good. How are you? Good, man. Thanks for taking my question. Appreciate it. Of course. It. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, yeah. yeah, feel free to give me, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but feel right. free to, to give me any more background on it. Uh, I mean, pretty self-explanatory. I'm just uh, yeah. trying to figure out, you know, where some good sources, you know. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think I think ClickBank is a good place to go because of the the gravity score, and you can kind of see stuff that's working right now. Um, I think if you know, if you see, like going back to what I said previously, um, if if you see ads on the web for stuff, and then you have a tool that can tell you an estimate of how many monthly impressions that a sales page is getting, then you generally can know if that's working. So, for example, if you see an ad for like a dog like health offer or like there's a dog uh like joint supplement or whatever i think it's a part of the golden hippo family uh and mm. i remember going and looking i didn't realize it was going hippo at the time but i remember going and looking and they have two variants of it and i think each one was getting like three million impressions a month which is a lot right that's that's for like a direct response offer getting uh three million a month and then six million total so you're like you know that's working again i used uh a similar web but um, there are, you know, other tools as well, but, um, but yeah, I, I think, I think ClickBank's a good place to go if you're trying to look in, and study and add, add to your swipe file. Yeah. For like Facebook ads, I was looking at the Facebook ads library and it doesn't tell you, I guess, like the impressions or like the comments or anything. It just shows you like what creatives are being used. So can't really tell if it's a, if it's a good ad or not, you know, I can guess, but then, you know. Yeah, usually the good ads are going to have like a lot of comments and stuff like that. So if there's a lot of like likes and comments and things, that's usually a sign that the ad's been running a lot. 
or if you see that they have like the same ad multiple times because maybe they've had to restart it for different reasons, mm-hmm. that's usually a, a good sign that the ad's been strong as well. Got it. Okay. I'll keep a look out for those. Appreciate it. Cool. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Sweet. All right. Next up, we have Luca Manichetti. Um, so he says, hey, Steph, my question for today, how would you write for landing clients for yourself? So you're a one-man agency and where and how would you advertise it? What's up, Luca? Okay. okay, so hi, Stefan, and hi, Ed. How are you? Good. Okay, fine. So my question is uh, primarily made because of uh, I went uh, through all the like uh, freelancing site websites like uh, Fiverr, etc. So the in the episode three, you said about. Uh, you starting on uh, Elens uh, that now is uh, Upwork. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, how were you writing uh, your uh, proposals? Because this is, uh, I see so much people on this website making proposals that are not so like um, helping uh, them to get the client. So right. I saw Luke Millis, sorry. I saw Luke Millis that made a uh, 1K on Upwork and uh, yeah. What do you think about uh, those uh, proposals? Yeah, I think uh, Luke had a really good case study. And I've been going through case studies the last couple of days for the freelancing course Ian and I are doing. And I had like 70 plus submissions from people. So I've been able to look at how a lot of people got their first client, which has been really cool. Um, The big thing that was cool to me is, is what I was doing in Elance back in 2012 is the same stuff that people, uh, the same things people are doing today in, in 2020. And I don't mean that like I'm an originator. It's just that it worked for me and it's people are doing the same stuff today. So nothing's changed, which is cool because it's like a universal. These are things that just keep working. So um, it really comes down to personalized proposals. It's like calling out you know, their pain point, demonstrating mastery, knowledge of the subject, uh, talking about, for example, if they've, if they've done like a link to, uh, a, to what their, their domain is like going in and even saying, Hey, I've gone through it. Here are three things that I think you could fix, but there's actually 10 things. These are the first three. Um, and then having a lot of confidence. Like I, I would always in my proposals talk about how I'm like, I'm not the cheapest, but I'm the best. And it was like, you get what you pay for, you know, if you're trying to get somebody and, and you're just, it's all about you know, budget, you can do that, but what are you going to get for that? Right. You're going to cut corners and, and going back to the ROI and how they're hiring, doing the math for them. Like I talked about. So being like, you know, when you hire me, you're doing it because you want to get an ROI. You don't want to have the work redone in a month. You don't want to waste your time. You want to have tangible results today. And that's what I offer. Um, so a lot of confidence, um, personalization, uh, really answering their pain points and then demonstrating why you're the the best person i think that's uh those are really the main keys okay thank you very much and uh can i ask you uh a fast question another yeah, one this is, this is two for one thursday <laughs> okay so yeah how do you what do you think about uh charging per word or uh, per letter so then lock for make a, a little example, made a video about uh, how copywriters should uh, charge charge their works. But uh, what do you really think? Uh, how do you charge? I know you charge by the value you give to your uh, prospect. But uh, how do you? What do you think uh, about the charging per word? Um. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's an okay strategy when you're starting out. I'm, I'm not, I've never done it really. And so in theory, I don't, I don't really like it, but I also understand people are at different places. So if you're, you know, like I just put on my calculator, right? If you say you charge five cents per word and you know, a hundred words, that's $5. So you char- you write a 500 word article, that's 25 bucks. And if you write that article yeah. in like an hour, 
that's $25 an hour and that's not bad, you know? Um, so if you're, you know, like early on and you're trying to just get some clients and build up your portfolio and things like that, uh, then, um, I think it's okay, but I think it's like a, a beginner strategy. And so as soon as you can get away from doing that and focus on, you know, the ROI and charging a higher rate and a flat rate, I'd prefer that. Oh, okay. Thank yeah, you. Very can much. I add something to that, Stefan? You sure can. Cool. <clears throat> uh, to me, uh, I think if you're doing like, if you're doing actual copywriting, then you charge for results. But if you're doing like article writing, then sure, charge per word, you know, because it's like you realistically you ask the client, it's like, what matters more? How many words I use or how many sales you get? If I think I can make you more sales with less words, what do you want? So yeah. I was this a question for me? It's just uh Luca, it's kind of me me sharing like sometimes it is like especially when getting started if you're doing articles sure do charge per word but if you're trying to do copywriting and sales it's not necessary at least that's my opinion okay so i i uh, asked this question because uh, i have done so far like uh, 100 maybe prospects uh, 100 clients uh, writing copy so i'm doing the copywriting work but uh, yeah I saw a lot of business owners that uh, concentrate themselves, uh, like asking, uh, what is my price per word? And uh, yeah, I don't like this thing uh, too much. So yeah, that's why I yeah. asked. I just think, yeah, I think the goal is to keep building up your portfolio, have more confidence in your proposals, and then get away from those people where it's like, you don't need a hundred business owners. You need five who are going to pay you a higher amount to write for yeah. a specific project. And I know that's easier said than done, but it happens, right? That, that's, that's what you, by, by building your portfolio, doing all those things, you can start to get better clients and then, but better proposals help. Cause again, I, I never, when I started off on Elance uh, and I did, I did content writing, I did web copy, web content. I wrote stuff for uh, like a logistics company and all kinds of shit. I mean, it's fun. It'd be fun to go back through all my original stuff. Um, I would take any job someone would give me. Cause I'm like, fuck, someone's paying me to like write and I don't have to have a boss. I'll do it. Uh, mm -hmm. and I did stuff for like $15 an hour, $20 an hour. Uh, but I never went like lower than that. And I just would make my proposals better. And I really quickly made my rate like 50 an hour. And then if I had to go down to 30 an hour, that was fine. Cause you know, that was still more than I was making at my job. Um, so, you know, focusing on, on higher quality proposals, I think can help a lot. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. And thank you, Ed. And yeah, thank you. Our pleasure. You know, Ed, before we get to the next question, I, this is just a small thing. I don't know if anyone ever read uh, Charles Dickens, but I, I had to read A uh, Tale of Two Cities in high school. And I don't, I don't know if you guys know, but Charles Dickens got paid by the word. And I fucking hate his books because they're just so long. Because like he just would make them extra long because he like was getting paid by the word. And I think he would have been a better novelist. And yeah, I'm sure I get Charles Dickens. He's like, you know, still really famous and a, a great novelist. But uh, I've always hated his writing and I think part of it's cause he has to, he got paid by the word. Ugh. The fact that someone would even recommend that. I'm just <laughs> astounds me. Cool. Let's, uh, hop on to, uh, okay. Hop on to the next year. We have a question here from Santiago for me. So it's good. It's perfect. Take my little breather. Yeah. There you go. Get, get your coffee, get your tea, whatever you got to do. Uh, he says, question for Ed, any advice for a young upcoming copywriter like you? Hey, Ed. Hey, what's up, Santiago? Thanks for the question, buddy. Going? I'm great, man. How are you? I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I wanted to give you some time to talk to. <laughs> nah, but. I mean, yeah, I wanted to ask you this question because I watched your interview. I think it was with Justin, not mm -hmm. with Stefan. Um, it was about a week ago that I watched it. And yeah, I've seen that there are some young copywriters like me, or let's say up and coming, like I'm a team, for example, and there's Luca that he was 
16 and David that he was 16 too in like here in the Gulf. And yeah, that's basically why I wanted to help, uh, why I wanted to ask you this question. Hmm. So, is this in terms of getting clients? Is this in terms of positioning? Is this in terms of how to write? I mean, what are you guys looking at specifically? Well, mm, I had to choose on what to ask you. It will be on getting clients, yeah. That's the part that has been the most difficult for me, at least. Hmm. For, for now. So, the number one thing for me is from what I've heard from talking to people, like, I, I want to say our age because I still feel like I'm 16, but uh, <laughs> like in, in our age category uh, is there's this huge hang up about age, but clients don't care how old you are as long as you're mature. Like it doesn't matter, like age will not come up if you're just a mature individual. Okay. Like I branded myself as the young person because that's how I got people in my corner. That's how I got okay, people yeah. to. Yeah, that's like a good angle to, to brand yourself. Yeah. So you can look at my name on the Cult of Copy job board and you can see some of my old Facebook posts that went completely viral in the group. So I think some of the most important things is one don't be ashamed of your age and don't try and hide it either okay. uh but also don't let it hold you back don't be like okay. oh because i'm this age i can't do it like when i was 16 or 15 i got my older brother to open a paypal account so he could take payments in for me right like just find ways to get around the system <laughs> yeah. um and Position yourself in a way, at least, I guess if you're getting started. Yeah, position yourself in a way that really makes you different. Even if you don't have like any crazy different skill sets, like, like I'm the Facebook compliance guy, right? Like, like I can say that. But back then I was just a 17 year old who wanted to not go to college and my parents were going to kick me out of the house. So that was my personal brand as going to be different. So if you can find a watering hole where all of your potential clients would be and just post in there frequently, giving value, making offers, helping people, being active, like the Justin and Stefan talk like, copy group, there's like some eight and nine figure business owners in there just fucking commenting to like the most random things. Like okay. I see like Chris Haddad and Kim Kraus in there. And they're like seven figure copywriters and they're just like chilling. And it's like, like, holy shit. Yeah. If I had this group when I was, uh, when I was, you know, starting out when I was so young. Right. But <laughs> as I tease Stefan, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I would be, so if I was in your guys' shoes, I would be posting in that group every single day, just something to provide okay. value. I'd be commenting every single day, just engaging in the group, giving value, helping out other people, asking questions, giving feedback. Because like, look, like the people who show up on this call, even like showing up to this call, we now, like me and Stefan now know you. We know who you are now. Yeah. And if you can keep showing up like that, the people who are in the chat who are watching, maybe one time you make a comment. And it's exactly what a business owner who's watching this needs to hear or see. And they'll yeah. reach out to you. This happened okay. to me the other day. It's like, I'm the compliance guy. I'm gonna talk about compliance. And I've had like two people, three people reach out to me in the past like two days or so. Like, yo, like I need your help. And I am not cheap when it comes to compliance. So cheap. dude, just keep showing up. That's the number one most important thing. Just by you being provide here. Provide value. Provide value, be on this call, join you know, Stefan's groups as much like in the RMBC group, I've heard of people who went from, they literally have been in other, I'm not going to say which ones they've been in other copywriting programs for like a year or something. And they haven't had a single client. They jump into Stefan's RMBC group. And within a matter of a week, they have three clients. I'm not saying that everyone's going to do that, but when you put yourself in the right place with the right tools and you, you buy into the right room, it makes it very easy to win.
especially when you have someone as amazing as Stefan, who's literally handing out opportunities like Oprah's hands out fucking cars. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nailed that, it. That was a great response. Yeah. Nailed it, Ed. That was so good. Got me fired up. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, he got me fired up too, like to be more active on this community. I mean, it, yeah, I think, yeah, today is my first call, um, like this type of call. Uh, it's the, the first time I'm, join, I'm joining, but I will make sure to keep showing up on 241 Thursdays and to be awesome. more active on the Facebook group. Yes, sir. So, yeah, thank you very much for your response. Ed. It's my pleasure, man. It's my pleasure. John Kim said, shout out to Ed for being a badass moderator. I agree. Um, <laughs> Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Yeah. It's true. I mean, I don't know how old Supreme, Supreme Win is, but that dude just like was posting regularly and Justin and Stefan talk copy. And then he kept posting and he had one that really, like he, he honestly, he did it for like a couple of weeks and then, but he was doing it every day and like talking about how he eats like once a, you know, once a, like once a night at dinner time. And so finally I was like, all right, I got me, I'll hire you. So I hit him up and I'm hiring him and I'm going to pay him like $2,500 to write like a mini sales letter for me. And like, I don't think I've ever gotten a copy. Like I think maybe he said one client or two client before. That doesn't mean like I'm going to hire everybody. I don't want to be, I'm not trying to say that, you know, but like it, but the point is like, I just, he got my radar really fast because he just kept posting stuff. And then I even told him like, Hey, don't worry about it. If it's not good. I was like, you don't do your best, but like it can suck. Don't put that pressure on yourself. And if it, does suck then um you know like i'll just work with you to help you get better uh but it's because he's around but everyone on these calls yeah exactly people just sort of um like yeah i recognize almost all the names who are here right and so you guys are all more in like my inner circle but i'm not the only one like it's the same thing like if you're posting regularly in justin and stuff and talk copy or in rmbc if you bought that course or you get the monthly training or whatever and and not, not just my shit i'm not trying to say you have to buy my stuff if you're in the Gary Halbert copy group or whatever it is, as you post regularly provide value, um, it'll come. And the one thing I'll say, and the one thing I'm really proud of is from a culture perspective, I'm trying to create a really inclusive culture uh, where you can be a total newbie. Like if you notice that in the Justin and Stefan talk copy group, people come in who are newbies. And sometimes they ask what are kind of dumb questions, but people still, not all the time, just, just every now and then, right? But, but even when that happens, we, people try and give them good, honest answers and put, point them in the right direction. Because I've been in groups where somebody asks a dumb question and everyone just trolls them. And not having that, man. Like, not happening that. Uh, like, it's everyone, everybody had to start somewhere. And so, like, I just want to lift everybody up. And that, that's the culture that I think it's set and at least all the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, and hopefully there's, there's, you know, other groups out there doing the same thing. So, yeah. Yeah, man, you've seriously built something cool here. I mean, I've, I've been part of certain communities uh, run by certain people and the culture is not like this, man. Yeah. So do an excellent job. Well, thanks. All right. So we have next question from Justin Lucas. Justin says, Hey, Stefan, any big red flags to avoid for compliance when running a blood sugar supplement promo, just like claims, uh, phrases, et cetera. Sweet. Justin, how you doing? Hey, Stefan, how's it going? What's up, Ed? It's going, it's going well. Um, yeah, so you run, are you running a promo right now? Or are you writing one or what's the story there? Yeah, so I'm writing one right now. Like, I, So I had got RMBC like a month ago and I finally got around to, you know, writing something and it's awesome. I was able to get through RMB within just a few days and then I'm going to write C like later. So like, there are just like a few things I want to, you know, make sure I'm not too aggressive with it. Cause like I plan on starting off with email drops and like, you know, I just want to be safe. Like I don't want to say anything too crazy and then like, you know, end up in jail or something. <laughs> yeah. Understandably. Um, and the short answer by the way is, and, and I know you're, you know, just kind of jokingly saying to end up in jail, but like realistically on health supplement stuff, like you're not going to go to jail unless you, if you're like, this like supplement cures cancer and like mm -hmm. it does. I mean, honestly, even then you probably aren't going to end up in jail. You're a shitty person. Right. But like, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to 
end up in jail. Um, I guess if you had like poison in your supplements and a bunch of people die, uh, you know, then maybe, uh, but you also don't want to get, you know, slapped by the FTC or regulatory body and fined and banned from selling supplements in the future. And that's really what the real fear is, right? It's like, it's, um, yeah. getting your name published on the internet and all that stuff. So within that context, uh, especially with blood sugar, which is a more regulated niche and you're trying to be kind of compliant, uh, you know, you know, the, the standard stuff applies. Like you're not curing, treating, reversing any, uh, conditions or diseases. Um, and you can't really make like implied disease claims either, which means mm. that you can't sort of say, well, for one thing, it can't be like, you know, a like cinnamon has been shown to lower blood sugar and, you know, reverse diabetes and this contains cinnamon. Right. Cause like you just like, well, basically the intent, they look at the intent. Like is your intent that you're trying to say that this cures, treats, reverses any disease with your, with your, kind of a uh, copy and what you're saying, what your claims are. Uh, so what you can do is really look at, and again, there's always a fine line when selling a health supplement because if we don't say it does anything, it's really hard to sell it. Right. Right. Um, but obviously you can say stuff like, uh, like look, look into structure function claims. If you haven't ever heard of those. So basically you can say that, uh, something like supports like, you know, healthy functioning, and it supports like the structure of an organ or something like that. So, you know, it can, uh, support, uh, support healthy blood sugar. It can help to support blood sugar levels and support normal blood sugar, things like that. Um, helps to support your, your pancreas, which is, you know, one of your insulin producing organs, you know, you can say stuff like that. No problem. Um, you know, you can talk about, erratic blood blood sugar within reason. Um, so that's thing we used in one of our blood sugar promos previously, and then we used it again in a new one. Uh, but in the new one we did, it was funny. We just had, we have a new blood sugar promo coming out and we have like an FDA oh, slash nice. FTC attorney on, uh, on retainer. And he was like, this is the most compliant blood sugar offer like I've ever seen, but I think the copy is wow. really good. Um, mm -hmm. but we talked about erratic blood sugar. Now he said we had erratic blood sugar like 50 times. And he was like, you got to tone it down. He was like, cause like, even then, like, if you're just saying it so much as like a substitute for like, you know, uh, you can't, you can't put erratic blood sugar as like a substitute for diabetes, but you can be like, you know, people are worried about their erratic blood sugar and this is helps to support healthy blood sugar. Um, you know, stuff like that's fine. Cause erratic blood sugar just means your blood sugar is all over the place. You can have, you can totally not have diabetes and still have erratic blood sugar or, you know, unpredictable blood sugar things like that. Totally fine. Uh, but as soon as you're saying this is going to lower your blood sugar or, you know, if you have high blood sugar, take this to lower blood sugar, uh, or this is going to help to fight diabetes, anything like that. Um, then, then you're starting to, you're talking about disease. You're talking about diabetes, which is a disease. And if you're saying that it's going to help, you know, address, um, the disease, that's, that's where you get into trouble. I see. Yeah, I definitely got a lot of stuff to clean up, even though I was trying to play it safe. Like some of those phrases like lean more towards like the uh, implying. So like I definitely got to fix that up. Yeah, and, and there's a fine line. I mean, you know, I mean, honestly, there's like so many, the, the reality is that for the most part, there's so many people out there who are bad actors and the agencies that enforce this stuff only have kind of like very limited bandwidth. So they're typically not going to go after you unless you're one of the most egregious ones right. or you look like really big and they think they can get a lot of money from you. Um, but that being said, if you can not, if you can kind of cover your ass anyway and just like, you know, minimize the risk of that happening and you can still sell, then you might as well do that because it just helps you to sleep a lot better at night. Cause what happens is people go more aggressive with their claims and they're like, I'll fix it later. Then suddenly they're uh -huh. doing, 2 million a month, 3 million a month, 4 yep. million a month, <laughs> money's coming in. They're blinded by the revenue. They're making profit. And then they're like afraid to try and change anything because the money will go away. But then they're having trouble sleeping because they're envisioning like the feds kicking down their door and taking them off to jail. You know, that doesn't actually happen. Um, but uh, so it's better to just sort of come out the gate with something that's cleaner and more compliant. Uh, and then mm -hmm. that way 
you can just sort of, yeah, you're more relaxed and you can scale without having panic attacks. I gotcha. And, and like, if you don't mind me asking, like, uh, do I need to get like a FTC lawyer like right away or should I like wait until like I get more scale? I, I think you're okay waiting until you get some scale. Like okay. there's no, like if, you know what I mean? Like honestly you launch it and if you do like a couple hundred thousand dollars in your first month, let's say um, in revenue, like you would just have to get really, like really, 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 really unlucky to like get into trouble. And I then see. even then, if you, you know, get a couple hundred thousand dollars in revenue, hire a lawyer and change it. And you got like a letter from a regulatory body that was like, Hey, you made these claims and you could just respond and say, I did. But then I hired a lawyer, realized that I wasn't in compliance and changed it because I want to follow the rules. Then they're probably going to leave you alone anyway. Um, mm -hmm. The people they go after are the people who have crazy claims and then don't change it and then just keep, you know, keep doing that. So um, I think, uh, yeah. So I think, I think you're fine. I don't think you need to hire an attorney until once you're live and getting data, but then I would do it once you're, once you're starting mm -hmm. to get some scale, I would do it just to clean things up and make sure, um, you know, you cover your, your ass. Awesome. Thank you. That, that cleared up a lot of stuff for me and I feel a lot better now. So thanks, Stefan. Cool. Yeah. My pleasure. And, um, <clears throat> one quick thing, uh, for compliance, uh, from what I've heard and from experience is just in general, especially on Facebook too, mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't want you becoming like a superhuman, like, you know, like fixing your stuff basically. But if you can talk about how this product or this service or this, whatever it is, helps support regular functions, then you're better because it's uh, not about saying, Oh, like it's going to cure diabetes. Right. But I say it's going to help support, uh, you know, healthy blood sugar levels because then, so, so imagine like there's like, there's bad, there's great. And then there's like homeostasis, which is like normal. They're here right now. Facebook doesn't want them going here. We want baseline. If that makes sense. Thank you. Oh yeah. And Ed, I'm definitely going to hit you up like once my offer is ready. So for sure. Sounds good. Thank you. Sweet. You know, Ed, my, um, I got my YouTube like creator stats, uh, for the month of May and I've only been putting stuff on YouTube like the last couple months or whatever. So I think at the, in May I had like 400 subscribers, but my, I think now I'm at like 800 subscribers, which is cool. But my watch time for May was like 37,000, like 800 minutes or something like that, which for having like 400 subscribers was crazy. Cause I'm so, cause I'm so freaking, uh, long form, you know what I mean? With a lot of this content, I'm going to start putting out more short content, but I was mm -hmm. putting in the chat. I wish I could, I wish we could go for like three hours, but I'm already probably too long at an hour and a half, but, um, let me, uh, I'm going to also shut up and then thank you. 774 is what I'm at subscriber wise, but let me shut up and, uh, let's go to more questions so we can get to as many as we can in the time we have left. Let's do it. All right. We have a question from, I believe it's Peter semis, but it says, yeah, it's Peter. <laughs> so <laughs> best advice you've gotten or learned on money mindset and attracting and keeping wealth. What's up, Peter? Hey man, how are you? I'm good. How you doing? Good, good. Enjoying the sun here. So it's a nice good, day. Dude. Uh, good. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about money mindset. I don't know if you've I missed the earlier part of the call. I hope you didn't talk about it, but um people can make money. Obviously there's two facts to that, right? The making money, keeping money. So mm -hmm. I know you're good at both. So I'd like to hear the the second portion of that. Yeah. Um and I'm still not I mean I'm I'm decent at keeping money. Like I've gotten way better at it as I've gotten older and part of my mentality was always like i'm gonna make enough money until i can't like outspend what i'm making and i'm like forced to save money that was always kind of a mentality of mine which is not a, a necessarily a smart mentality it's just the way i approached it and um and then again as you get older and have a, a child and a family you get a little bit more uh you know kind of about that um an interesting realization i had in 2015, 2016 was that, uh, my, your business finances will often reflect your personal finances. So if your business is sort of like in disarray or you don't really know how much you're making or you're bringing money in, but you're not like keeping it, um, you'll generally find that that's reflective in your personal finances as well. 
So I think that's kind of an mm-hmm. interesting lesson. Uh, so if you run a business, like, you know, the two are really go hand in hand together. Um, mm-hmm. I think that sitting on cash is never a problem, never a bad thing. I and mean, people, the thing about having money is like, you always want to put it somewhere, um, which makes sense, right? Cause you want your money to work for you. Uh, but I think that having a stockpile for a rainy day and being comfortable with that and okay. Cause for example, say you've got like whatever you have, whether it's, you know, $10,000 or a million dollars just sitting around in cash and you're like, like, well, right now I could be investing in this, this or that, but like, you also feel like there's a probability of like a recession coming or something bad happening. Like for example, of COVID when Facebook yeah. stock went down to $139 a share from like $220 a share, it's like, yeah. And then it went back to 240 or whatever it's at now. It's like, so basically if you're sitting on that cash and you see those opportunities and you can act, um, the returns you can get are really massive versus feeling like you always have to immediately take your money and put it places. But of course, in order to do that, you do need to have the discipline to not just look at that money and do dumb shit with it. Um, which is important, right? Cause it's, it's easy to look at it and be like, I've got this money. I should spend it. Um, yeah. I mean, those are a couple, I, you know, but I, but I think the biggest mindset too, like I, from a mindset perspective is that, um, like if you like not feeling guilty, I mean, the biggest thing people have is hangups and guilt around money and they feel like they don't deserve it. They don't deserve what they're being paid. Um, they feel like they're a bad person and other people want them to be like a bad, you know, other people judge them or feel negatively about them if they have money as well. The way I feel about it personally is that, I'm never going to apologize for having a lot of money, but like my entire goal is like just to get everyone else a bunch of money too. It's like, I'd rather, instead of apologizing and not and limiting myself, I'd rather not apologize and bring everybody up to my level. Um, and so, but I think that's a mindset shift versus the upper limit stuff like Gurley mentioned and, and it's in the big leap, which is a really good book uh, of people just sort of looking at it and feeling like I've got to give some of this, I got to get rid of it. I shouldn't have this. I, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not about the money. It's what do you do with the money? Like having a lot of money enables me to then do this call without charging people. Cause like, I'm not worried about where my next fucking, I mean, I could be retired. Right. Which is great. But like, I don't have to worry about where my next monthly rent or mortgage payment is coming from or how I'm putting food on the table. So having money to me is, isn't a tool that enables me to then help more people. And so if I didn't have that money, I'd be way less effective and I wouldn't be able to help as many people or reach as many people. And so I look at money not as an evil, but as this incredible gift and this incredible asset that enables me to make really powerful change in the world. Um, so I think maybe thinking about money from your perspective of what does the money enable you to do, right? What does it help you to get, like, what, what, what can you do with that money? And not just about making more, but like, how can you impact the world in a positive way? And if you align that with making money, then I think it becomes easier to make money and to feel less, uh, hung up about it. That's a good paradigm shift. Thanks, Stephanie. Cool, man. Yeah, happy to help. Beauty. <clears throat> We're on fire today. We got 10 questions down the No, down the I, want, I want more. Let's go. Let's do it. Okay. Oh, this is a good question. By the way, at this point, you should just <clears throat> co write a book with uh, Gay Hendrix or just like. <laughs> I know. Hey man, you said you want to write a book, you know, do like freelance. I want to write a bunch of books. I know. I'm actually going to write a book soon. I was thinking about the other day. Nice. I want to start a publishing company, so I'll publish it. Ooh. Oh, hey. Let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, question from Conrad Diaz. Uh, any productivity tips for reading all these books, writing all the copy you write, and running the businesses you run? What's up, Conrad? Conrad, I can't hear you if you're, uh, if you're talking. Could be Conrad stepped away from his computer for a minute while uh, didn't expect to be called on. But I'll start answering because I think it's a good question. Um, the big things for me are deep work. Like, I mean, I'm scheduling time for deep work. Um, so like, really, I'm looking at, okay, for every, any given week, what are my major, what's everything I have to do? my uh, kind of like must, must do things, my biggest needle movers, my things that are urgent but aren't important. Kind of like the Eisenhower box is which people, if you haven't heard of an Eisenhower box, look into that, um, sort of like that. And I go through and then I'm kind of picking out my top 
two or three needle movers that are like, these are my needle movers. These are the things that I, if I get these things done this week, I'm going to feel really good um, about, you know, myself and my week. Right. And okay. So out of those two or three things, how many hours is each of those things going to take? And then, so say one's going to take 10 hours, one's going to take five hours, one's going to take seven hours. Um, okay. That's 22 hours. All right. Perfect. Now here's my calendar in front of me. What time blocks do I have right now for the week that aren't, and I have other commitments or things where I can just schedule the deep work time to do these. And then which one do I want to do first and how am I going to do them within my calendar? And then in addition to that, having stuff that's sort of set like around all that. So this call is Thursdays at 10 Pacific, my time until 1130. I may try and go another 10 minutes again today if that allows me, cause I want to answer more questions, but basically 10 to 1130, 1145, whatever set my calendar. Now that I'm doing this, um, uh, the RMBC applied program that I'm doing that's Friday is 9.00 AM. I'm assuming they'll go for about an hour and a half, but I'll probably allocate two hours just to be safe. Um, so that goes from nine to 11. Um, perfect set. Uh, I have like a weekly call the supplement company that I'm involved in from one thirty to two. So I have all this stuff like set. I like reoccurring and I have my, my big needle movers and I have those blocked out on my calendar and those times for deep work. And then even stuff like my daily email, right? Well, like I basically just wake up at five 30 in the morning, five forty five. which by the way, waking up early is like a just massive game changer. Um, it just really, really makes a big difference because you have more time. So that's when I'm going to write my email, res- my daily email to my list, respond to emails, catch up on Facebook. Um, and I allocate time for my, my fuck around time to just go on the internet and do dumb shit, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, by doing that, it just sort of helps me. And then everything else in my list that like isn't urgent or important and that isn't the biggest needle mover, one of the top three, I kind of look at it. If I, I have that checklist so whenever I have free time or a scheduled free time, I try and go through and check off as many of those things as I can. But if I, you know, can't get to them, then it's okay. I'm also, I also accept that there's things I want to get done that I just won't get done. And I was actually thinking about this recently, uh, how if I look at like my to-do list and say, I don't look at it for a week or two, cause I'm doing other shit and I come back to it. Or I look at something I wrote down and I was like feeling stressed out. I pretty much got everything done. Like we don't have to, you, the big things and important things that you need to get done, you'll get done. So you don't have to sit around stressing about them and keep writing them down, repeating them to yourself again and again and again. Like it doesn't need to happen. Like they'll get done. Uh, sometimes it may take a little bit longer, but that's okay. Right. In the grand scheme of things, like we have years and years and years on this planet, hopefully. So rather than stress out over, yo, I didn't get all these things done in this five day block. It's like, all right, whatever, who cares? I got done 14 days or 21 days or whatever. Maybe it took a little bit longer than I wanted, but it doesn't really affect anything in the grand scheme of things. So uh, those are sort of the big kind of the way I approach all of that. Cool. Thank you, man. Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure. Beautiful. All right. Next question from as Courtney jazz asks, how important is getting down the voice of a client in your copy when you're using RNBC to write the letter in less than a week? What's up, Jess? It's good to, it's definitely good to talk to you again. Yeah, yeah. you as well. So, yeah, you write you write letters so quickly. So, how do you get down the voice of your client? Yeah, ideally, if the client is somebody who has like you know videos on YouTube or uh, you know, who writes regularly or whatever it is, I mean, I think if you spend a couple hours reading or writing or talking with them, then you know you generally have a pretty good uh, good feel for it. I mean, that's, that's really the biggest thing I think is just sort of like looking at their style and how they talk and their colloquialisms and things. And then, um, you know, bringing that. And then I think, yeah, you don't have to be perfect again. I know the only time that I ran into like a perfection issue was with, uh, Tony Horton, the P90X guy. Cause like he, like I interviewed him a couple of times. We did this stuff. I wrote a draft and he'd be like, I, I just, I'd have said something like, um, uh, what would be an example? Like, I felt like my head was going to explode. And then he'd be like, I wouldn't say it that way. I'd say like, I felt like my head really hurt. And I was like, okay, Tony, like, I don't know. <laughs> like at one point I literally, I told him, I'm like, Tony, like, I understand dude. 
I was like, but honestly, short of you and I being like best friends for the last 20 years and spending, you know, every like time together every week, I'm like never going to be able to write exactly in the way that you think. Like, I think this is a pretty good approximation based on watching interviews with you and talking with you and recording conversations. And, um, but he was like really the only person who ever really was a challenge for that. Uh, but generally I think if you're just sort of, um, yeah, if you just sort of like do whatever you can to familiarize yourself with them, spend like a few hours doing it. And I think usually that's good enough. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense then. Cool, thanks. Sweet, awesome. And Gulam Noah, I didn't write the P90 ads. I just did some stuff for him and, and the company recently. But yeah, happy to help Jazz. Ed, let's go, squeeze in a couple more. We can do it. All right. Trying to find some questions we haven't answered like that much or from people who haven't asked a question yet oh i like this question okay question from let's make sure he's on question from pedro martins what's a typical day for stefan look like it's a pure productivity and habit oriented question cool pedro what's up man Pages. There you go. What's up, hey. buddy? Hey, Stefan. Hey, Ed. Can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. How are you guys? Doing good. Well, How are you I'm doing? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm actually cooking dinner. <laughs> nice. What are, you, what are you making? Uh, Scramble eggs, uh, some chorizo. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Nice. Love some chorizo. This would like to... Today would be my my dad's birthday, so we have having like a a little party to celebrate him. So that's, that's awesome. Fine. That's really nice. Good stuff, man. Dinner at Pedro's house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Absolutely. So yeah, the, yeah. The question was yeah, it's pretty much self-explanatory, man. Yeah, a hundred percent. So um, let me get back to the question here. Like a typical day right from productivity habit oriented question. Um, yeah, I kind of, I answered it a little bit in the previous one. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, primarily, uh, and Paige, Paige, let me have you meet yourself while I answer just because of the, the cooking. Yeah, background. sure. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, but yeah, it's like waking up at like five thirty, five forty five, 5 uh, drinking coffee when I can, I try to like do a walk or something. It's different. Like in, in Vegas, it's so, warm in the morning that's actually great for doing a really early morning walk uh in san diego where i am right now it's more overcast in the morning especially during the summer uh, so i'm less motivated to do that uh but going on i honestly typically checking like my my email and going through messages pretty pretty fast because i just like enjoy doing it uh like i used to spend like a half an hour reading the newspaper like i'd read the wall street journal uh la times and the las vegas review journal but I found that for whatever reason, that actually kind of didn't set my tone of the day in a good way. Even though like the Wall Street Journal, I feel like is fairly objective compared to, I think most newspapers aren't. Um, I just sort of, maybe it got my mind going too many places or distracted me. And I feel like I, I didn't have as much, I don't have as much focus when I do that. So uh, I'd rather kind of jump in and start answering stuff and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, then I'll tip, a lot of days I'll take a break say I woke up at 5.30 at about 6.45, 7, and I'll read a book for about a half an hour. And that can be anything, whatever I'm reading. It's usually not the same book I'm reading at night. Uh, but, you know, if I have, it may, it may be something that's more like stimulating and less and more practical, like a business book versus like a history book. Because um, I read a business book at night, my mind gets too like, starts racing and I don't fall asleep. Um, so then on 7, 7.30, I'll write my daily email. And then about eight o'clock, I'll jump into my deep work stuff. Usually I have calls. I, I really try to schedule any calls as much as I can until at least, I really would prefer like 11, 11, 30, 12. I really try to schedule my calls in the afternoon because my better, my most best working time is in the morning. Um, like today I had a call at nine with somebody, all good, but I really try to avoid that. Uh, and then since like the lockdown around eight, between eight and eight thirty, I go up and get my daughter up. So like wake her up, start the day with her. And I'll usually chill till like nine. I mean, that's the big secret guys. Like I'm working, I'm working less right now 
because of the lockdown and I'm at home. So I, I spend like from about 8.15 to 9 o'clock with my daughter. I work. I put her down for a nap. That's from about 12.30 to 1, 1 1.15. And I usually stop at like 4.30 because then it's like family time. Um, so I'm actually, wor- I know it sounds crazy because I do a lot of stuff, but I, I, I'm working like probably, it feels like I'm working like six hour days. I, I guess like the, the early morning time is what really makes up for that. But, um, but I don't feel like that's work. It's sort of just catching up on stuff. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. So that's kind of the main things. And then, like I said, all what I said before with the deep work stuff and all that. Thanks, man. Yeah, absolutely. Enjoy dinner. Let's do like so, two more, two or three more, Ed. If there are two or three more. There's a lot more stuff in. It's so funny, dude. I know. Oh, sorry. I know you're Ed, Ed's such an awesome guy just giving his time to do this. And then I keep I've honey potted him. I roped him in and then <laughs> poor, poor guys is trying to like, you know, just trying to make a living, man. I know. Is, is this right. your game plan? You're just taking up all my other clients time. You're just like, like yeah, take like it one, at least one or two more. Just, just, I know. I'm teasing you. I'm teasing I know. You. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay. We got a good question from Marcus Sortillas. Uh, actually, so it was actually from Young. Marcus posted it because Young is having some issues. Young is gone though. So do you still want to answer it? Let's do somebody who's on the call. Okay. Yeah, guys, be sure to give a thumbs up on the question you want answered next. Because a lot of the ones that are in the chat right now are like ones that we've already looked at. Yeah, make sure you check the timestamps on the replays of these other videos and you'll see that some of these, um, you know, have been answered before. It doesn't mean we won't ever answer them again because there's yeah. value in hearing, you know, different answers to the same question. But but in general, I would love, if there's anything new, I'd love to. Yeah. It's even like questions that are like, they're all variations of the same questions we've had answered on. Uh, like in today's call. Uh, okay. We have a question from Josh Knox. So Josh asked the first question, can ads be too topical? What's up, Josh? Hey, how you doing? Well, I waited a long time. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm just well, it's been a good we, call. Got, we got you in bro. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hey, um, so my question is this, and I honestly I want to be really sensitive about it because it, it because it is a sensitive topic in today's news. Um, and it's this. So you know I serve small businesses, and so I had the I had the thought the other day of of a headline or a, a topic of small business matters, mm. um, and so I. I wondered, and I hope it's not offensive to anybody. I really do. I, I just wondered if that is too topical. Like, can you go that far with your copy? And instead of getting that response that you're looking for, that emotional spon- response, it's a good emotional response. Can you get a bad emotional response? Yeah, I think and my, my philosophy is, I don't think, you know, I think asking questions is always, um, like, you know, we're, we're fucked as a society if we can't ask questions and then consider them. So, you know, I think th- thinking about that as an idea and, and talking about it is um, totally reasonable. My my guess, my gut, I don't have a scientific answer, but my gut is not, you shouldn't do it. Um, I just think that while I understand the rationale behind it, and I also understand, um, I also think that there's a, a segment of people who would really be like pumped and like it. I think it just opens too much of a can of worms. And I think that it would too, too many people would be concerned that, you know, you're taking attention away from black lives matter um, or what's going on. And so I think it would too much of a risk of, of backfiring um, and, and creating like a negative experience. So I just think it's one of those cases where, yeah, I don't know if it's like, too topical, but it's, it's probably just not worth the risk, even if it might cut through the noise, you know? Yeah. And that's why I asked the question because uh, from my perspective, right, what's going on is an important conversation that has to happen. But what's also going on is millions of small business owners are suffering as well. Right. So that was where the thought originated. Sure. That was the genesis of it. But I, 
I had the same sort of gut reaction that you just had. I was like, okay, I get where my brain's going with it logically, but my gut says it's probably not over the top. I don't think that's the right word. It's just probably not the right time. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, you can speak to the fact that these businesses are struggling and, but I think anything that that's going to then draw comparisons to, you know, the racial inequities and, and, and injustices that are happening and, that's going to invite people to say, are you comparing and contrasting? Are you saying, you know, not to pay attention to the fact that, you know, black lives matter or that, you know, there's police brutality or whatever. Right. I think just as soon as you open that can of worms and people, you know, see that, um, you know, fair or not, right. Cause you're, you're not trying to say like, of course, when you saying, you know, the small businesses matter and stuff, you're not trying to say that black lives don't matter. Um, but you know, that being the case, I, I think the way that it'll come across and for too many people, uh, it's just, yeah, my perspective is just not, um, it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Understood. I think if you did something about like, 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 so you can be topical, you can be very topical, but it's how you do it. So saying stuff like all businesses matter, that's, I think that's definitely going to land you in hot water, but for something like protect your business in these uncertain times, that's fine. Yeah. I, yeah. I've thought about that as well. And that, <laughs> It's funny because I was actually just on a marketing uh, call with a um, company that we service and they, the guy that was giving the marketing presentation played, I don't know, a dozen clips, which, which just said exactly what you said, Ed, is, which is in these troubling times. And so that is the noise now. Everybody yeah. is saying, and I get what you're saying, Ed, I'm, I'm not coming at it, but everybody is saying the same thing. In these mm-hmm. troubling times, small business, da, da, da. so anyways. Yeah. No, I get it. I think, yeah, you, I, I think finding a way to cut through the clutter is good, but again, I just, I just would, uh, I think it would backlash. It would yeah. backfire. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for the, thanks for the response. Appreciate it. Of course. Of course, man. Ed, let's do one more. I'll get one more. Uh, okay. I've already selected which one I want next. Okay, great. My boy, Josh Copeland. Dude, that's good. I just opened it and I was hoping cause I want to rant about it. So good hey stefan what do you think of performance only deals actually i have one right now going on so I'm, i want to hear your thoughts too hello hey josh how's it going what's going on Steph? it's a pleasure to meet you your legend and what's going on man oh uh, man it's been a while i know dude you've come up so tough bro freaking dominating your path and stuff congratulations on your success appreciate it thank you yeah man um so so I've been writing copy for a while and I've, my, my successes, uh, you know, they're not as consistent. And I found my, I find myself getting caught up in a lot of performance only deals where, um, you kind of have to like prove to the client that you can provide results. And, uh, I was working with, I was actually working with the fifth funnel guys on a really big offer that didn't pan out. Um, that was a strictly performance based deal. And, um, both Tyler, Ryan, and uh, and Sam uh, Sam Ro- Robson was like, performance deals are the devil. <laughs> don't ever go them. Don't do it. And it's like, I, I you know I was, I was agreeing with them for a second. I'm like, you know, and I believe it to to a to a fault. But I have this one client right now who he's a dating coach, and um, his his business is kind of like not doing as well as I wanted to do. But I have control of his email campaigns, his, his, all of his copy, his, his funnel, his funnel, everything. And I, I kind of want to give him results, but at the same time, like, I feel like, you know, if it's just a performance only deal, am I going to get, am I going to get screwed at the end of the day? Because if it doesn't work, right. I, uh, you know, I pretty much did all this work for free and I know I can provide the results, but if I'm not, if I'm not getting paid, it's kind of hard to, continue being a copywriter and like living the lifestyle that I want to live and stuff like that. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, my thoughts are they'll work out like one out of every 10 times. So I feel like you can, you can do it, but I would be wary. And then I would only, I, I ideally if I want to do a performance deal, I'd want to find one that is like a small amount of effort and high leverage. So for example, somebody has an email list or not doing anything with their list, but they have like a hundred thousand names of buyers 
and they're like, Hey, you know, you can set up like a campaign mail to that list and I'll give you 30% of the revenue generated. And I'm like, all right. And if I know I can do that in like five hours or 10 hours, um, you know, maybe that's worth it. Uh, it also comes down to like who I, who the person is, like, do they have credibility and a reputation in our space? Do they have, you know, a good, like, are they, are they like someone who's been around for a while, things of that nature. Cause generally performance deals are being offered by broke ass people who haven't hit any scale yet. And they're like, once they hit scale, you know, everything's going to be magically better and it's not. And even if you do stuff for them, they are typically going to fuck it up and not be able to pay you. Cause either they make sales, but they run out of inventory cause they didn't think about that. Cause they've never like scaled before, or they're not actually making profit because they didn't know what their numbers were. Um, all of these sorts of things. And it's just really hard to get paid on performance deals in my personal experience, especially performance only. Uh, I prefer to take, maybe you could take less, you know, money upfront, but still have like a, an upside. Um, but I, I, I don't, I don't want to say that they're never going to work out. I know a few, I know people who, who have done performance deals that have worked well, but typically I would only do it if it's a really vetted client who has a proven track record and who like, I know will actually pay for performance. And that's a fast implementer. Cause the other thing is you do it, you do a performance deal, you create this stuff and then they're like, all right, perfect. And then they don't ever launch it or they launch what you did in like nine months later and kind of half-ass test it. And you did that work, but it never actually goes live and goes to market. So that kind of ends up uh, fucking you too. So I think you can do them as like a moonshot occasionally, but I would not make it my bread and butter. And I would, I would not put a ton of time into those. I'd find, like I said, high leverage ones where it's a little bit of effort uh, leads to an outsized result. Mm -hmm. uh, that's sort of my f personal take on it. I would love to hear Ed's take as well. So yeah, actually one of my clients now is uh, Pure Performance but they are an eight figure company and they only pay, like, they don't pay any base for any of their copywriters. It's only like pure performance. It's really interesting. Um, so one really good piece of advice that Justin Goff gave me uh, at the last copy accelerator event was he told me to have one, re one or two retainer clients that just pay monthly to cover all my bases, cover all my bills, and then no problem. And then go after more ballsy things um, after that. So right now, like I have one client who covers all my bills. And so because of that, I can go after these high risk, high reward performance deals. And that's something to really think about to, before you start chasing the performance deals, get that comfort, get that security first of the retainer client and be sure to have them locked in and really over deliver for them. And then they'll just keep hiring you to work with them. And then you go after the performance deals. Um, some of what Stefan said, like smaller is usually better. It's like better to work with a client who has existing stuff that you can just kind of tweak or edit to be the control or boost AOV or boost whatever it is, right? Like for example, the one that I'm working on, uh, they want me to revive one of their offers. So the offer was doing okay. And then it shot the bed after a while. Uh, the upsells are incredible. All of it's amazing, but I have to rewrite a new sales letter, which is fine. I actually enjoy doing that. So it's, it's cool. Uh, it's taken me a few weeks, but if it was like, I have to redo the whole funnel, I have to like, I even had to create the offer from scratch like, and tweak it, which I enjoy doing again. So it's like, if you enjoy doing it, it's not that bad. Uh, but from a pure work perspective, it's probably not going to pan up being worth it monetarily, but fulfillment wise, it's a lot of fun. So it's, it's pick and choose, you know? So, so if you were to, um, you know, if you were to, you know, obviously optimize a deal where it's like, okay, um, I won't do a performance deal, but what I can do is I can, I can take a little bit up front and then we can work out a performance based incentive. I mean, what's the best, what's the most effective way to go about that? Because I know a lot of clients do a lot of pushback where it's like, oh, uh, you know, I've been screwed in the past before. I, I even had one client tell me that my time didn't mean shiznit to him. 
and all that mattered to him was the results. <laughs> you know, and I kind of was like, what? you know, and it's just it's just kind of frustrating. It's just like the same same um, objection that I keep facing. So mm -hmm. I guess my last question here was was the is how would you go about structuring the deal that they could say no to? Can I jump in on this one, Stefan? I'm just yeah. some ballsy. Go for it. Go for Stop it. Stop going after broke clients, dude. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. what I'm hearing. Because somebody who's like, oh, I can't, like, somebody who's only trying to get you on performance, they either really know what they're doing or they have no fucking clue what they're doing, which is why they can't afford to pay you. Yeah. And I'd just be like, I also would differ. I mean, if I'm talking to somebody who says, I've been burned in the past, I'd be like, oh, that, that sucks. But what does that have to do with me? You know what I mean? Like, okay, yeah, cool. Guess what? Well, I have this amazing track record. You know, here's all I should have done. It's all worked. Here's a bunch of people you can talk to. So sorry you were bad at hiring somebody in the past, but now you're talking to me and you're talking to me so that you don't get burned in the future, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but you got to pay me up front. Like, that's just the way I operate. And I usually charge this. I'll give you a discount. We'll do it for this. But I want to have a, you know, there's going to be a performance kind of component to it. And this is how I want to look. Uh, but ultimately, yeah, man, it is, it's leveling up your, uh, leveling up on the clients too. Cause there's, those people mm. exist, but that's like, they're just like, they're all here. And if we can just get you coming up a little bit higher, um, yeah. then yeah, that, that's gotta be the goal. I've, I've actually never ran into that issue where it's like somebody like, I'll just say like, here's my price. And they'll be like, Oh, I can't afford that. I'm like, great. <laughs> yeah. <know>? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm too nice because I'll, I'll try to work with them. Like, well, we can do like a payment plan or, or what, what is your budget? And maybe I, maybe that's like my big thing too. But yeah. I, that, that's just the thing that I keep running into. I feel like I'd be making six figures by now if I it's, just hop over this hurdle. <laughs> yeah, dude. It sounds to me like you want them more than they want you, which is not really where you want to be as a freelancer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I, there's so much power in that. So like, ahead, Ed. Yeah. They need you. Like you can live and you can have a lot of other clients, but if they don't get their shit sorted out, they're not making any money. So they need you. Like, I think once you realize the power in that, like you are not just wanted, you're needed. And you solve a very big problem. That's very lucrative. It's like, for example, uh, so about two, three months ago, I charged 2K for, or yeah, I think it's like two, 3K for a VSL. Um, and then I charged like 5k for a sales letter for uh, Stefan and Justin. And I'm like, Oh, you know what? Let's bump, let's bump up the price to 10k, you know, for my next client. So this was a compliant, like a compliance job though. So somebody wanted me to go through their whole funnel and make it Facebook compliant. And so I was like, all right, 10k, let's do it. They're like, okay, how about we do 5k up front and then 5k after you hit, after we hit 50 K in sales. So I'm like, great. Cause then that overcomes the objection actually. And I'm, I, that's actually going to be like my new offer. Well, I'm probably gonna bump up the price again. Cause it's a fucking big job. Probably 7.5 K up front, 7.5 K after they hit 50 K in sales, but we'll see. Um, where basically there's no, what if you just leave me? What if, you know, this doesn't work. It's like, dude, I want the rest of my money. Like, don't you worry. I will make sure this works for you. I think if you can find, like, if you're really running into those issues first, look at it, I think as a either wrong audience issue, self-worth issue, or a um, lack, of, lack of confidence issue, which is also a bit of self-worth as well. So I think if you can address those three things, you'll have most covered. And then if you still feel like you're running into it, I don't know if that's all covered, which you shouldn't be. And you start charging higher ticket. I don't know what you charge right now. Do a half up front, half later, but with incentivized numbers. So it'll be for example, it's like, Hey, you know, once this is cranking to, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 sales a day, then you pay me the other half, but that's risky because you have to know that they're going to launch it. So that is the other part, right? Like you have to know. I think Stefan mentioned like half up front and then half like on a certain date. doesn't matter if they've launched it or not. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I, I just prefer half up front and half upon delivery, but 
if you can't swing that, then at least like half a pound launch. But if it doesn't launch by a certain date, then you get paid regardless. I think I actually got that from Brian Sparanello, who's in the copy accelerator. Um, but that was solid. Cause that, that's the problem. I had one guy, it was like in half when it launches, but the guy took like six months to launch it. So after like three months, I was like, Hey dude, like you got, you got to pay me the other half. Cause it was for 50 grand. So it was like, like $25,000. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, Hey bro, yeah. like, you know, I've given you like three months. Like you, you know, either you launch it or you got to pay me. Um, yeah. And to his credit, he did. He actually just rehired me for something. But when he rehired me, I told him half up front's fine, but half upon handing in the copy, not like when you launch, because I don't want to go through that again. And he was understanding. Okay. Um, but yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, I really, really appreciate this, guys. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm actually, you know, fighting through a lot of negative beliefs, but it's, it, I'm getting to a point where, yeah, like I, I do deserve you know, that kind of money. And uh, I'm going to go take your, your, take you guys' advice. Thank you so much, Ed. You know, I see you out here killing it. And um, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be more, um, I'll be more uh, active in the chat in the uh, group from now on too. Awesome. Cool. cool. Good. Thanks, Josh. Good All right. um, hey, Ed, we're going to, we're going to wrap up here because I do have to go be a, be a father. Don't have to. I get to be a father. I'm excited All for ready? that. Already? Come on. Not one um, more, Stefan. One more. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to do one more? Do you have one more? I, I enjoy answering questions, so if there's one for me, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, I'll, I'll no. take a look. Okay, take a look. I was just gonna say, um, I had a conversation today with like my designer, one of my designer. Actually, he's a project manager, Hussein, who's in Pakistan. I've been working with him since like 2016, uh, and he watched my freelancing video I put on YouTube about making 10k a month. And he's like, "Hey, you know, you're right. I feel like we're undercharging. We did a." A whole funnel they do like him and his team will do like design dev integrations all of this stuff and their design is really good which is important design is a huge conversion factor and he's like you know we got paid three grand and the funnel did like 10 million dollars or something like that and i feel like we could have charged more and i was like yeah you totally could have and he's like but he's like i always think though I'm like what if i lose clients you know if i charge more money and um then you know people might say no and it's as funny as it sounds it was like yeah dude i'm like that's fine. Right. It's like, it's like you like, do you want, you would rather have fewer clients who pay you more than more clients who pay you less. Right. And like, mm -hmm. that's an important mindset shift. Like losing clients is great. And if being detached is so important, like I used to not, I used to think it was kind of like a hipster thing, like hipster entrepreneur thing to like, like stoicism. Uh, but, um, at the same time, like then I kind of like, uh, have realized that it's so true. Like, and again, it helps if you have income streams coming in. So to Ed's point about having some good retainer clients or whatever it is, or if you have a business that your business is creating cash flow, uh, whatever that is. But um, once you have that and you can be detached from it, you will just, your life will become a hundred times better. I literally had on today's Thursday. So Tuesday, somebody hit me up. I was like, Hey, I heard you're the best for supplements. Like I want to do a funnel, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Hey man, well, I'm not taking out a lot of clients, but I'm about to close on a house and give them a check for $589,000, which I'm doing tomorrow. Um, like, so, you know, uh, I'll look, be, I'm open, but you know, just, you know, I charge 50 grand, other people charge less. Um, did it kind of what I do, you know, here's why. Um, and you know, he was like, uh, all right, well, I'm not going to negotiate. It's so like, you know, can we, can we get like a lower, more realistic number, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, uh, it's like, no, I was like, honestly, I was like, if you want to pull the trigger, like right now, like I'll, I'd probably do it for 45,000 just because like, it's going to be, take me 15 hours, but going back to my hourly rate, I shouldn't have done that. But I'm like, also at fucking Jerome's, like the furniture shop, buying a bunch of like recliners and leather sofas and dropping grand, like, several grand. And so mentally I'm like, Oh, which is my own hangup to keep working on. Um, but, uh, but then like, you know, he kind of didn't respond, but it was like, okay. And like, I'm not, I'm, I, I always, I'm going to follow up with him is to try and get him to hire somebody in copy accelerator for less money. But like that detachment of it not bothering me at all that I didn't get, you know, but if I went to 30,000, we hired about 30,000 is just not worth my fucking time. And I'm lucky to be in that position, but it doesn't matter if that's 30,000 or if it's like $300, wherever you are, but being able to be detached from that outcome is great. And every time saying no is what leads to more opportunities, right? Every time you say yes, you book yourself up and you say, now you're saying every, every single yes is like a no to 10 additional things in the future, right? The potential things. And so being able to say no more often is just so, um, so valuable and important. But mm. Ed, let's let's go ahead and, and wrap up here because I do want to go do uh, 
dad dad stuff and everything and for sure but uh well thank everybody you guys thank you so much for um for hopping on for joining us really really appreciate it I, I, I love doing this um and i'm just so honored you guys come and join us and ask questions and if you you know if we didn't get to your question and authentically i'm sorry wish we could have but we will definitely uh do this again next week and, and answer more and then for everybody who's in rmbc applied we'll be hanging out for two hours tomorrow uh breaking down a sales letter how i beat a control in the health space that have been running for like two years and we're gonna go through it in a deep ass detail so can't wait Thank you, Ed, also. Thank you for having me, dude. Always happy to help. You're awesome, man. Really appreciate it. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Talk soon.